Konnichiwa, Joshua Walker here at Japan Society. I am excited to have uh, Susan Miyagi McCormick on Tea Time today. Susan is the founder, writer, and editor of Japan Culture NYC that is a must resource here in New York for everything related to Japan. Uh, she's been a friend of Japan Society since being a member in 2001 and far before that. I'm looking forward to having a conversation today with Susan, whose mother is from Okinawa, her father's uh, from America, and talking about what that bicultural project uh, has meant to her in her life and the work that she's doing. So Susan, thank you for joining. Let me start with a, the easy question. Um, tell us about yourself, your love of Japan, and how you decided that this was going to be your lifelong passion with Japan Culture NYC. Well, you did mention that my mother is Okinawan. My father was a white American of Scottish heritage. Um, but I, I grew up very, very American. So my love of Japan didn't actually happen until well into my adulthood. So I, I like to tell people I'm 50% Okinawan, but 100% American, mm -hmm. because I, you know, my my mom didn't teach me the language growing up. Um, she felt like, you know, after she married my father and they, um, he was in the military, and when they settled in the U.S. after he retired, she became a, a U.S. citizen. So she felt like, well, I'm an American citizen. I need to speak English. And keep in mind, this was also during the 70s and 80s in North Carolina. So the climate for um, multiculturalism was a little bit um, not where it is today, I'll say. So I, I just had this very American existence. And I, I like to tell people that my mom was from Japan because I, I thought that sounded uh, really cool and exotic, but I didn't identify as a Japanese or an Okinawan specifically. Um, it wasn't until my late 20s that I felt like I wanted to learn the language and um, you know get to know that side of my culture a little bit. And a, a friend of mine, um, says I'm a born again Japanese American. <laughs> and I like that, I like, I kind of like that phrase because I, I did come into the culture a little bit later, but I'm so obsessed with it that I feel like I just take in as much as I can it, whenever I can. So yeah, I kind of made it my life's passion after feeling guilty, I guess, for neglecting that side of my heritage. Well, how fascinating that you come from these remote areas with very distinct cultures and you end up in New York where literally in the Big Apple, it all gets mixed together. So tell me about kind of Japan culture, NYC. How did this come to be and kind of what are some of the, the, the highlights of your tenure uh, that you've been working on at Japan culture of NYC? Well, back in like 2006, I started a blog. Everyone was starting a blog <laughs> back then. And um, and it was it was called Shrine Castle, which is the um, literal translation of of Miyagi Shrine Castle. And I just kind of, I think you know, six of my friends from high school read it. But I just kind of like talked about my life and stuff. And I started focusing more and more on um, Japanese events that I would go to. And in 2006, most of them were at Japan Society. You know, there, there wasn't as big of an explosion of Japanese culture back then. And I would just write about like different movies I saw or things like that. And then I decided, well, what if I wrote about them before they actually happened and people could go with me? Um, but because of that, uh, different people at Japan Society started noticing when I, whenever I posted and then, you know, we we would meet each other at the events. I'd be like, oh, aren't you Susan? You wrote about this. And that's how Japan Culture NYC was born in May of 2011. So a couple of months after um, the 311 disaster. And yeah, it just kind of has grown from grown and blossomed from there. And the amount of people I've met, um, the friendships I've formed as a result of that, uh, my increased involvement in the community has all been as a result of, of Japan Culture NYC. It's been quite fulfilling. So you talked about being a born again uh, kind of Japanese American. Um, 
I think everybody has that aha moment where they, they in some ways crystallize that passion for Japan. Do you remember what that moment was for you or was it kind of gradual over time that you kind of just fell back in love or fell back into your, your roots that maybe you didn't even realize as you were growing up as such an American that Japan was a part of your life? Um, I do remember the moment. It's actually uh, kind of, it's kind of a sad moment, but um, it was my mother's birthday is April 1st. And um, I was living in Boston at the time and I was 30. I was 30 years old living in Boston and every day I did, uh, did the crossword puzzle in the Boston Globe. But in, on the page of the crossword puzzle, it has um, you know on this date in history. So I thought, oh, it's my mom's birthday. What happened on this date? And the very first entry said on this day in 1945, um, the U.S. military invaded Okinawa and the Battle of Okinawa began. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that there was a Battle of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I never learned it in school. And I grew up with a woman from Okinawa who turned 11 on the day that the U.S. invaded. Mm -hmm. And she never once mentioned it to me, ever. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was like, I don't know my own mother. I don't know anything about her. And I don't know anything about Okinawa. And so I immediately just like started diving into what is this battle of Okinawa? What happened? And um, started interrogating her, but she's really good at deflecting questions. But mm -hmm. I felt like uh, she does not want to talk about it. She gives me a little, a few answers here and there. And last December, we went on an epic trip uh, together to Okinawa and she she talked more about things than she ever had in terms of like her her past experiences um, during the war she wouldn't address specific things but she every once in a while she dropped a few memories on me um, but yeah at that moment and that was um, 20 years ago that's when I felt like this now's the time for me to to figure out what it is about my my Okinawan side, my Japanese side that I had completely ignored growing up. So can you talk yeah. to us about the specific issues facing uh, Japanese and the Japanese American community here in New York during this time from COVID-19 to the political season that we're in? How is the community coming together? Uh, mm -hmm. What's the community doing for this new normal that we're kind of seemingly in for a period of time? Yeah, well, um, I'm a member of the Japanese American Association of New York. And, um, you know, in pre-COVID times, we host um, Cairo, Cairo Kai, the Cairo Kai, which is um, a group gathering for at least 100 seniors in, in our area um, twice a month at JAA Hall. And obviously, we haven't been able to do that since March. Um, so we, we started Project Bento, a friend of mine, Natsuko Ikegami, who is a real estate agent here in New York City, called and she said, you know, I'm, I'm seeing all this stuff. People are, are starting GoFundMe campaigns to help um, feed the frontline workers. And, you know, what can we do as a community? And so I thought, well, what if we did grocery shopping or something like that? And I reached out to Irina Yoshida, who um, is the COO of the Yoshida Restaurant Group. What if we did grocery shopping or something? And she was like, well, I mean, I can donate a hundred bentos and um, well, let's, let's start there and see what happens. And so we got a little committee together. We talked about the logistics of how we would um, deliver bentos to seniors in a safe way and um, pitched it to uh, JAA's uh, executive director, uh, Michio Noda, and the president, Susan Onuma, and they were like, okay, yeah, let's do it. So we've, we've been doing that since May 4th, and we've delivered more than 2,000 bentos to seniors in the area. So, and, and it's not just about the bentos because we have call volunteers who call them every week and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, are you feeling well? Do you, do you need help with anything? Errands run, do you, you know, 
have to go to the hospital or anything like that. So it, it's been a really amazing community bonding type of situation and in the worst possible um, um, event here in New York City with with COVID and, you know, we're all feeling isolated, but this is the way we've come together. To me, the best of the Japanese American community that you've been such a big leader in is Project Bento. Uh, and to literally see, we had the chance to, to host uh, Project Bento here at Japan Society, uh, I think on Eel Day, Unagi no yes, Day, right? Yes. And I just loved watching you and so many of, of these respected leaders that you mentioned come together and literally put these bentos together. Mm -hmm. And you could just see the love and care going into every one of these and to give people a taste of home because particularly in a pandemic where you can't even go out to eat, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we got all these beautiful notes back that just, you know, were, were thanking mm -hmm. us. And the thing they focused on was, this made me taste like I was cared for and that oh. someone cared and I was able to feel like I was connected to home. So I wanna thank you on behalf of the community and behalf oh, of Japan you. Society. So what are some of the best ways for people to get involved with uh, the Japanese and Japanese American communities here in New, in New York? Well, I think um, hmm, becoming a member of Japan Society is always <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> I endorse that wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, following Japan Culture NYC on social media is a good way to, to find info about what's going on, uh, becoming a member of Japanese American Association. And you do not have to be Japanese to be a member of, of the Japanese American Association. There are a lot of groups. Um, it depends on what your interest is. Really, uh, the community is quite diverse. And you know, as much as people say Japan is a homogenous country, it's actually quite diverse. And there are a lot of people who have different ideas of their Japan, right? Food and drink, anime manga, um, kimono culture, um, ikebana, tea ceremony, film. There, there are so many ways. And even within those subsets, there are different, different ways of looking at things. My advice is, you know, if you have, if you have an idea about what you like, search for it. You'll, you, you won't have to go very far to find it in New York City. Susan, thank you so much. Um, I really found this conversation fascinating uh, and I really appreciated you opening up and giving us the, the full perspective of who, who the, the, the writer and the founder behind all these important uh, areas. And I just on behalf of all of us who care so much about the US-Japan relationship, I want to thank you not just for Project Bento that has brought so much light into our senior community, but also given opportunities uh, for us at Japan Society to give back, but also just for, for your spirit and the way that you personify the very best of U.S.-Japan relations, even without even knowing it, uh, from Okinawa to North Carolina. So thank you for joining us. Gambate uh, Kurasai from this going forward, and thank you for joining us for Two Time. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. I really appreciate the time.